thank you very much um, for the opportunity. Um, unfortunately, Gilbert, I don't know whether he's still sleeping. All right, so I'll just share my screen and then start with a brief introduction. Okay, as, as the, the host rightly said, uh, my name is Clement. Um, I'm a final year PhD student um, at Cardiff University um, and I, I do mathematics. So today I'm very happy. And also I'm also the, the president for Ghanaian students in Wales. Um, so I'm also happy to, to also um, impart um, knowledge as well and learn from each other. All right, so today's topic is actually I'm going to be dubbed general knowledge on statistics and then um, data analysis. So basically statistics is very broad. So I'll try as much as possible to condense it. So this is just going to be like um, a, um, an introduction where you can build upon. Um, I didn't originally plan to use um, slides, but later I realized that making the slides will help the presentation to be more organized and then yeah, help me with planning of my time as well. Okay, so we are not going to spend much time, but I'm sure um, we will spend at, at least an hour or more, maybe more, not more than one hour, 30 minutes, but I'm sure it's between one hour to one hour, 30 minutes. Okay, so I, um, or we could even finish earlier. All right, so, okay, so this will basically be the outline of my presentation. Um, let me maximize this one, first of all, okay. All right, so this is this is going to be the outline of my presentation. So basically, I'm going to first of all give a brief introduction to statistics and some related fields, and I'll give um, a useful information about data analysis, and then um, I'll talk about regression analysis and variable selection techniques. Technically, there are a lot of uh, models we could have looked at, but I wanted to condense and restrict myself because um, it's a very broad field. So the only thing we can do is to kind of restrict ourselves to certain, um, 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 let's say, analysis or models, and then um, we can build up from there. And then next one is we are going to, that's the last, but not the least, we are going to talk about some statistical software is available and the advantages um, over the other. Okay, so, so first of all, um, what is statistics as a field of mathematics? So keep in mind, mathematics as a field um, has so many branches. So so basically, we have pure math, we have um, statistics itself, we have operational research, we have um, data science and analytics, so many, so many fields, even by statistics, they are all branch of mathematics, indirectly, they are also branches of statistics. So when you talk about statistics, what do, what do we do or what is statistics all about? So statistics is basically about collection of data, analyzing your data, and after analyzing, your interpretation is very key. And then after the interpretation, definitely it, it will be used for policy making. It will be used for um, um, further explorations. So, so basically, statisticians help us to learn and understand better about any phenomenon based on the data. Okay, and and the field of mathematics is a, a, in a little way very correlating and inter, interdependent on each other, such that for some reason. Statistics cannot survive alone without um, an application of, let's say, pure mathematics. And, um, and then let's say operational research is also another field which is closely related to statistics. So technically they do everything statisticians do, but this is more um, um, related to um, um, the industry. So, so it's more like they try to make sure they make their, statist their statistics very practical and very useful to the industry. It doesn't mean that statisticians might not also or cannot also do that. But I just want you to keep in mind so that in some future time when you're applying for maybe a PhD, master's or any course, you also bear in mind that there's a whole course, especially in the UK, there's a whole course called operational research, which is very related to statistics. They do everything statistics. However, um, um, they, they try to do things that are very, very practical. So, um, so can we please, those in the background, can we meet our videos? Um, there's a little bit background, feedback from the background. Okay, so so like I was saying, so personal research is clo uh, closely related. So, but what they do is that they do a lot of optimization. They do a lot of, um, so with the optimization, they definitely would deal with um, um, transports. So there are a lot of transport problems 
and then and they do anything statistics actually statisticians actually would do and when you talk about econometrics as also a relevant field of statistics so econometrics basically as you know um if you know those who do economic economics so in econometrics it's all about time series regression models and so on so they are all uh, kind of ad adopted principles in statistics biostatistics is a form of statistics but with um, emphasis on health or health uh, modeling okay so we even have bioinformatics which is also closely related to biostatistics and we now have um, a very um, um it's not recent but it's recently developing that is data science okay so data science and data analy analytics is also now taking over um, and they are all closely related so these are fields that are related to statistics that you can think of all right so now one thing i want you to keep in mind is that when you talk about data analysis okay every single data analysis can be categorized strictly into two so we have the descriptive and then inferential statistics so basically if i talk about data analysis in essence i'm talking about statistical modeling and in essence i'm just briefly talking about statistics so keep in mind that statistics as as a, in terms of data analysis can be categorized into two so we have the descriptive and we have the inferential so in every um study you should make sure you have these two versions represented um, in your study okay so when you talk about the descriptive statistics it's basically trying to talk about the fact that you have a data like we said statistics is all about um collect um, collection of data analyzing your data after the analysis you have to interpret okay and and then and then and then they uh, for other uses of or let's say beneficiaries of your results to take it from there isn't it so and keep in mind that um we expect to see some form of descriptive where you are summarizing the data. So the descriptive is all about data visualization and also giving some summary measures, like let's say trying to tell us about the means, median, mode, maybe ketosis and skewness and other information, which proportions and those kind of things. So basically in every, and then when I talk about the, um, the visualization, we are talking about the, the pie chart, the, the bar plots, the histograms. I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of, um, um, descriptive um, visualizations uh, as in data visualization you can actually do so keep in mind that that's always the first thing you do in any statistical research or in any um, research so keep in mind that in any field you find yourself at a point in time you need statistics it doesn't matter the field so basically the statistics is more like the building blocks um, 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 upon which um, research can actually be made possible so without statistics you cannot actually have make inference and make conclusions with confidence It's actually statistics that makes all these possible and then with the inferential statistics keep in mind that with the descriptive you are basically summarizing the data but you cannot make meaningful deductions from it so keep in mind that you can only say it appears that maybe the proportion of females um, um, and it's maybe is higher than that of males, but you cannot conclude that maybe females are more likely to maybe get COVID-19 than males, okay, until you do an inferential statistics. So the inferential statistics is actually where the um, hypothesis testing or the statistical test and then the statistical models actually comes into play. Now, one thing I want you to keep in mind is that we shouldn't always confuse statistical tests with statistical models. Definition of model in different fields is very different from how statisticians or mathematicians define models. When you go to um, fields like maybe I mean, not necessarily psychology, but maybe sociology, maybe social work, how they would define a model, okay, even a conceptual framework that we would just define as conceptual framework, they would they can classify it as a model. But in the context of statistics, those those are not like our definition of models okay so let me try and distinguish statistical tests from statistical models now now when you talk about statistical tests okay and um, statistical test basically deals with trying to test an hypothesis and when you talk about hypothesis it's just any statement which could be true or false okay um, and then and then always with the hypothesis testing there are there are two mutually exclusive um, statements that we are trying to test but the null hypothesis is what we wish to test but the null hypothesis always should contain the null statement. So, so always like if you are comparing means, you should always say that maybe there's no significant mean difference maybe between groups. You don't say there's significant mean difference for the null. And keep in mind, it's always the null we test. But, but we test, we do the hypothesis testing based on the alternative hypothesis, okay? I wouldn't go into much detail, but I want you to have a fair idea that there is something we call that so because I said inferential statistics um, encapsulate um, both um, hypothesis testing 
or statistical test and statistical models. So basically with a statistical test, you are testing an hypothesis. An hypothesis could be any statement you are interested in, okay? And those statements you cannot derive or drive in um, conclusions based on the descriptive summaries or the descriptive statistics. Because I said that descriptive statistics is just to give us a fair idea what is happening inside the data or what the data can tell us before we actually start actual um, inferential statistics. So as the name goes, inferential. So inferential means deduction. So it is after you've done inferential statistics, that's the only instance you can confidently make conclusions. Okay. So keep that, keep that in mind. Now, so when you talk about the models in statistics in the in the context of mathematics or statistics, it implies that there are some underlying parameters, okay, that we need to estimate. Okay. So keep in mind that um, anytime you have you, you have an equation, uh, any equation with unknown parameters, such that we can estimate those parameters that equation can be termed as a model or a statistical model. So do, these are the things we have to keep in mind. So, so you realize that with statistical modeling, we are estimating parameters, but with hypothesis or statistical tests, we are not estimating, um, we are not estimating parameters, we are rather testing hypothesis. But keep in mind that when you, when you estimate the parameters, you would be interested in, in, that is in the context of the statistical models, you'd be interested in um, identifying or concluding whether the parameters were significant or not. In that case, the statistical testing also comes in to complement it. So statistical tests and, and statistical models, in a way, they go together, okay? So keep in mind that there are two different things. One is testing hypothesis, but one is helping to estimate parameters of a model. And those parameters, we will learn a little bit about what I meant by parameters. Okay, so there are some brief terminologies we need to familiarize ourselves with. And then, uh, because since we are trying to study or get a good introduction of statistics. So, so when you talk about parameters in the context of statistics, okay? So like parameters is always um, any measure you compute from a population. So before then, when you talk about a population, okay, in context of statistics, it doesn't mean the whole of Ghana. It doesn't mean the whole of China. It doesn't mean the whole of um, 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 like Shanghai, uh, okay? That is not the definition of um, 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 population in the context of statistics. Basically, you are doing a study, okay? So when you are doing the study, you might be interested in a certain group. That group you are interested in is what we call the target population. Now, the total unit or the total number of elements within that target population is just your population. Okay, so I could just be interested in studying, let's say, um, let's say the prevalence of, let's say, HIV, or let's say the prevalence of COVID-19, since it's actually the, the disease of the day, maybe the prevalence of um, um, COVID-19 within, let's say, or among some, some um, private school in Shanghai. That, uh, that uh, particular private school, the total number of students in, within that school will be your population, okay? And then, um, yeah, so that will be your population. And any, any subset you take from that population is what you call your sample, okay? So I just want you to keep in mind that population does not mean the, the whole of a country, okay? So population is just, the, the, it's more like basically the, 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 the group of interest, the total no, number or the total number of individuals within the group of interest. And then understand that the target population is always the group you're interested in. And then the, the total size is actually informing your population. And anytime you obtain a subset from it or you select part of, of that population, that's when we, we call a sample. Now, when you talk about a parameter, okay? So, so keep in mind the definition of parameters is basically what was said already in the model model part because when i talked about the inferential statistics i said we have the inferential statistics and we have the um, we have the statistical test and we have the statistical models now we talk about parameters parameters are simply any unknown values okay or um so par parameters are always unknown but they are measures we compute from a population okay so keep in mind that parameters are measures we compute from a population and then statistic don't confuse statistic with statistics. So the statistics is the subject, okay? Now the statistic is any measure you compute from a sample. So you can use this abbreviation PP, population parameter, sample statistic, okay? So it implies that I can ask you this simple question. Um, maybe there, there was a class I wanted to look at maybe the mean, um, um, uh, maybe GP of students in a certain class. And what I decided to do was that first of all, 
um, 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 I went to, I, I selected that class I'm interested in. So basically that class becomes my population. Now, if we're asked this question, under what condition would the mean GPU of students in that class be considered as a, a parameter? And under what condition would it be considered as a statistic? What answer would it give me? If you're able to give me that answer, then that implies that you actually understand what a parameter, the difference between parameters and a statistic. So basically it implies that the, the, the average GP of student in that class will be considered as a parameter if we consider the entire class in computing the average. But the very moment we consider a subset or part of the class in computing the average GP, then that average GP becomes a statistic. And keep in mind that hardly can we compute the parameters directly from the population, especially when your population size is very large. Okay, so, so keep in mind that the statistic or the sample statistics are always used as what estimate of the population parameters. Hello, so, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hello. Yeah, I can yeah. hear you. Hello. Hello. Ben Carson, Honorable Ben Carson. Should I go ahead? Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, so like I was saying that, so, um, so basically the parameters are any measures you compute from a population, but when we have large population size, hardly can you compute the parameters directly from the population. So we use the sample statistic as an estimate of the population. And, and in terms of estimate, it meant that the estimate should be good. So we have some characteristics of a good estimate. Any good estimate should have some peculiar characteristics. It shouldn't be biased. It should be unbiased. It should be consistent. It should be efficient. But you cannot get an estimate that satisfies all these conditions, that condition of unbiasedness, um, sufficiency, um, efficiency. But at least if it's unbiased, then, then, then it's good enough because an unbiased estimator implies that its mean will be actually or will converge to that um, population parameter value. Okay. So just keep in mind that statistics are only used as what? estimate of the population parameters. And don't confuse statistic with statistics. The statistics is the branch of mathematics. The statistic is any measure we compute from a sample. Okay, now what are the types of variables we have? And keep in mind, because we are going to deal with data analysis, we'll be hearing terms like variables. And, and when you talk about variables, what are they? So look at the name, variable. It, it implies we obtain it from the, the, the word vary. When we say something varies, we know that it's something that changes, isn't it? So it means that any characteristic, okay, that actually changes is a variable. Why is age a variable? Because if I if I if if I talk about age, can't we get different values of age? Don't we have different ages? Meaning that as far as age changes, it makes it a variable. So anything that varies is a variable. Any characteristic that varies, height, we have different heights. It makes height a variable. We have different GPS. It makes GP a variable. We have different colors. It makes color a variable. Okay. So keep in mind that is basically what variables are. Um, we are, but we have something called random variables, which is a little bit in depth, which we wouldn't go into it because you don't really need it for for um, your case. Okay. But for um, it's useful. But for your case, don't confuse variables with random variables. Okay. Um, random variables basically assigns element in um, something called a sample space, a real number. And I don't want to go into that um, information or that details because we don't really need it for this presentation. So how many types of variables do we have? Keep in mind that every variable uh, or all variables can be categorized into two. So we have the qualitative variables and we have the quantitative variables. And it's technically out of that that we, um, we had um, different types of research where we had qualitative research and we had quantitative research. So as the name goes, quantitative means that it's something that deals numerically, right? So quantitative variables are variables that naturally take up numbers, whilst qualitative variables are variables that naturally do not take up numbers, okay? I, I, I want to explain it in very basic terms so that um, anyone could appreciate because technically people could have just Googled what the types of variables and you just be memorizing and pouring something. But I want to explain in layman's terms so that you can actually appreciate what 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 we are doing um so so keep in mind that we have all variables can be categorized into two quantitative and qualitative qualitative variables are variables that do not naturally take up numbers okay examples sex um, um race 
anything that do not take up naturally numbers. If you, if if I talk, if I ask you what is your height, the first thing you, you mention is a number. If I ask you what is your age, the first thing you mention is a number. Okay, and that makes it a quantitative variable. But if I ask you what is your name, you give me a name. If I ask you what is your sex, you whatever you say is just a name. Okay, if if I say that what is your maybe um, your COVID nineteen status positive or negative it's just a name so keep in mind that makes it qualitative but one thing we have to be very careful is this in research or in data analysis these qualitative variables we would assign some numbers to them but assigning numbers to them doesn't make them a quantitative variable this is something people should keep in mind assigning numbers to quali uh, qualitative variables and another name for qualitative variables are categorical variable. So when you hear the word categorical variable is the same thing as qualitative. Why? Because every single qualitative variables uh, or every single qualitative variable has categories. Every single qualitative variable has categories. So that's even one of the best ways to distinguish a, a, a qualitative variable from um, um, qual um, quantitative. So like I said, for every single qualitative variable, sex, if I say sex, don't we have the categories, males and females? If, if, if you give me, let's say, color, we have different colors. So you realize that for every qualitative variable, we have, we have, we have um, categories. So that's why we also call it um, categorical variable. So qualitative or categorical. And I said that for quantitative, they naturally take up numbers. So another um, name for quantitative variables are numerical variables okay now now i was uh, i was um, creating a, um, 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 a disclaimer there what i said was assigning numbers to qualitative variables do not make them quantitative okay so in research maybe let's say you had a variable called gender and um, sex and it was males and females okay but you realize that for the sake of maybe your statistical analysis, you needed to assign a dummy code to it. When I say dummy code, you are assigning maybe zeros and ones. So you, you gave maybe male zero and female one. Well, that, it doesn't mean that always that should be the order, isn't it? Because someone can even use 29 and 30 and just say that 29 means a male, 30 means a female, and it will still work in any software. It doesn't mean that I should always use zero and one. There's only one instance why when you should strictly stick to zero and one. I'll talk about that when when we get when we get to the regression part. But apart from that, apart from that, um, you can use since it's a dummy variable, uh, since it's a categorical variable, you can use any dummy variable. So or dummy code. If I say dummy code, it implies I can use zero and zero for male, one for female. I can use one for male, two for uh, females. I can even use thirty for males. 29 for females. It, it, and I just have to tell the software that 30 means males, 29 means females, and it will still work, right? So you realize that technically it doesn't take up numbers, but we can assign numbers. And the reason why we assign numbers is for us to be easily be able to um, um, do further statistical analysis with them, but it doesn't make them what? It doesn't make them um, 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 quantitative, okay? But there's one instance where there are certain variables that we cannot naturally measure and we call them in statistics latent variables. So these latent variables, for instance, if I want to look at a company's satisfaction, I mean, let's say you are customers and we want to assess this, um, your level of satisfaction with, which is with, with some company, they would have something called a scale. Even your happiness, we have a scale for it. How sad you are, we have a scale to measure sadness. We have a scale to measure a lot of psych psychological variables. Now, those variables, you know that technically, I couldn't have measured your happiness, isn't it? But we've been able to design a scale. When I say a scale, it's just a set of questionnaires. I mean, it's a questionnaire with a set of items. And those items together should quantify your, maybe your happiness or your love or whatever. But now, now keep in mind that after quantifying these ones, okay, in terms of the scale, in that case, you've in a way obtained something numerical. Okay, so 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 keep in mind that if you have a latent variable, a variable you cannot actually measure in reality, but you only need to what um, 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 use some form of scales or use other information, which sometimes we term we term them as constructs to actually measure them. So what happened is that once you're able to get that um, that scale and you, you actually quantify that scale, now the, the whatever measure you have or the values you have, we can now tag them as something quantitative. Okay. But, but once you assign dummy codes to, let's say, um, um, sex or, let's say, 
um, STEM and um, maybe let's say level of education you are assigned on the course, it doesn't make them numerical. Okay, now we have something called scale of measurement. Without, I wouldn't want to waste too much time there. Keep in mind that I said that we have two types of variables. We have we have the we have the um, qualitative and quantitative. Now, if a variable is qualitative or categorical, it has it can either be it can either be a nominal variable or it can it can if it can either be a, a nominal variable or an ordinal variable. So when you talk about the scale of measurement, we have four scales of measurement such that every single variable can fit into one of them. So the scale of measurement, we have four. One is called the nominal, followed by the ordinal, followed by the interval, and the last one is the ratio scale, okay? So, so basically, I'm, I'm just going to distinguish them shortly. And um, I'm sure most of you, when you are doing any form of basic statistics in your course, your respective courses, you come to a point where they will ask you to be able to um, categorize some variables into these scales of measurement. I'm, going to get, I'm just going to give you a trick so that you don't, you don't have to memorize anything. You should be able to put any variable into one of these scales. Okay, so, so, so like, I, like I said um, earlier, so we have four scales. Now, if, and then we have the nominal, the ordinal, okay? Now the nominal and the ordinal actually be um, 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 qualitative variables would either be nominal or ordinal and quantitative variables, okay, would either be interval or what, or ratio. Okay, so the very moment I ask you, let's say, what is the um, scale of measurement for, let's say, height? You don't have to think about nominal and you don't have to think about ordinal because the height is numerical. Okay, so keep in mind that when a variable is categorical or, or, or qualitative, okay, um, there's a little bit of feedback. And if the variable is uh, numerical or qualitative, okay, one thing you have to keep in mind is that it will either for within the nominal scale or the ordinal scale. Now, what is the nominal scale? So basically, I mean, at a point, just as humans, we learned how to do classification. You know, at a point, we could have called males, females, and we would have accepted it. Um, I don't know whether you understand what I meant. We, we all grew up, or let's say we, we grew up, and one day we said, someone like me, call that person a, a male. You know, they could have said, when you meet someone like me, call, call that person a female, and we would have accepted it because that's what we came to meet. So what I'm trying to imply there is that for nominal scale, they don't have any justification. They are just characteristics attributed by names, and there's no justification for that. And technically, um, every variable has a name, right? But so meaning that for something to be either um, um, in the ratio or interval scale, it's already nominal, okay? So the order that I gave you, it's, it's, it's actually sequential. So the nominal is the weaker scale, okay, followed by the ordinal, but the two form the scales for the qualitative variables. And then the interval scale and then the, and the ratio. So the ratio is the last one and it's actually the most powerful. Now keep in mind that for something to be ratio, it is already interval and it is, it, it might not necessarily be interval, but it is already ordinal and it's already nominal. So keep in mind, all qualitative variables, they, all quantitative variables also have names, isn't it? So the mere fact that they have names, it implies that all um, quantitative variables would already have satisfied the condition for nominal and the ordinal scale. So I just wanted you to keep that in mind. Fine. Now for the nominal, what we said is that it's just by names and there's no, there's no justification for the names. Now the ordinal is when now those names has some form of odd, odd, ordering in there. So the very moment I ask something like educational level, is it going to be a nominal scale or is it going to follow the ordinal scale? You ask yourself educational level, do we have any form of ranking in there? And you can clearly see that educational level, we have some form of ranking. We have primary level, basic level, primary level, tertiary, and you could see some form of ranking in there. That makes it what? An ordinal scale. So always when you are asked to classify a qualitative variable into the two scales of measurement, specifically the nominal or ordinal. The first question, the easiest way that ask yourself, is there some form of ordering? If there's ordering in there, then it's ordinal. If there's no ordering, then it's nominal. That is very simple way of classifying any qualitative variables into either nominal or, um, or ordinal. So if I ask you, let's say, um, let's say colors, yellow, green, blue, whatever, and I ask you what scale, you ask yourself, is there any form of ordering? Clearly, you cannot say yellow is bigger or better than blue or whatever. So in that case, it's nominal. Okay, so I've, I've, so that's 
So for the qualitative, we are done with it. Now the quantitative, that's the part that I want us to really distinguish. Um, and that's so many people are always confusing themselves with the interval scale and the ratio. Now the interval scale and the ratio, they have peculiar things in common. I already told you that basically they, they are numerical, isn't it? So it means all numerical variables or anything, any variable that takes up numbers would fall in one of them. But the, the, main distinct, the main difference between the two is this. There's something called absolute zero. When you talk about absolute zero, absolute zero implies that it's like, when I say zero, it meant there's nothing. For instance, if I say I have zero CDs, it meant I don't have anything with me, okay? But if I say zero degrees, degrees Celsius, it doesn't mean the temperature is zero. It doesn't mean the temperature is, is finished or is gone. Zero degrees Celsius has a meaning. It actually means that the, 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 the temperature is cold. Okay, so it meant that zero degrees is not an absolute zero. But if I say that there, there are zero chairs in the room, it's absolute zero, meaning there are no chairs in the room, technically. So, so the, the, the way you can distinguish between interval and, res, um, interval and then um, ratio um, skills is that use the absolute, um, absolute zero. That is the easiest way. What I mean by the absolute zero is that ask yourself, can that variable be zero? And if it's zero, does it have a meaning? And if and so if it is zero and it has a meaning different from the fact that it's empty, then it's interval. But if it is if it can be zero and the meaning of that zero means emptiness, then it means it's ratio. So if I ask you, um, let's say number of chairs, which um, um, which um, scale of measurement would you place it? Would you place it under um, quality uh, uh, under interval or let's say um, ratio? The first thing you ask yourself is that the number of chairs. If it is zero, what does it mean? If the number of chairs is zero, it means there, there are no chairs, then it's ratio. But if I ask you something like, let's say height, okay? Height of, let's say, humans. And I ask you, can the height of humans be zero? If it's not possible, okay, can, can height of a human be zero? Height of a human cannot be zero. So in that case, it meant that it can't be within the context of what? It can't be in the context of what? Um, 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 ratio. So it can be a ratio, but height at a point could be interval. So in this case, height is interval, but height at a point could be ratio um, depending on the height of what subject are you talking about. So there are instances maybe I'm talking about height of something that is infinitesimally small, such that it could be zero. I mean, sometimes it could be thickness. I mean, we could have, I mean, thickness of something to be of almost zero. So, so meaning that Height as a variable, okay, could either be ratio or interval, depending on height of what are we talking about. So if I'm talking about height of humans, as far as we don't have any human being who has a zero height, it meant that there, 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 there can't be an absolute zero within, within um, the in, um, ratio um, um, scale. Another simplest um, explanation or way of distinguishing is that for the ratio in, um, scale, they can never be negative. The ratio scale, they can never be neg negative. So you realize that we can have a negative um, temperature, but you cannot have a negative height. We cannot have a negative age. We cannot have a negative. Um, so it meant that once you cannot have a negative of some specific variables, they automatically also forms under the ratio. So, so with this um, um, trick, you should be able to classify every single variable into one of these um, um, categories. So I will just proceed. Okay, so the last item on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, um, on this slide is about the types of statistical tests and models. I've already explained what statistical tests are and what models are. So for those who just joined, we said that for statistical tests, it's basically testing an hypothesis. But for models, we are estimating some unknown parameters. But after testing or estimating the unknown parameters, we need to test whether these parameters are significant and then statistical tests also come in. So technically models and statistical tests, they, they go hand in hand. Now, every statistical test or models, we have two versions of it. At some, at statistically, we have three versions, but technically there are two. What I mean by there are two is that for every statistical test, we have a parametric and eight non-parametric uh, version. So we can have a parametric statistical test and eight non-parametric test, which we'll learn very soon. And for the models too, we have parametric models and non-parametric models. But what I meant by, in some cases, there are three is that we have semi-parametric models, okay? So, so, in, the, so in the context of, um, for statistical testing, we can have strictly parametric and non-parametric tests. But for models, we can actually have parametric, semi-parametric, and then non-parametric models. 
So I, I just want you to keep in mind, but broadly, in general view, we can classify any statistical test or model to either be parametric or non-parametric. Okay, so just just keep that just keep that in mind. All right. So so this is just to uh, a, a, a graphical um, um, summary of what I I I I described earlier. So I wouldn't go much into this. Um, you would have these slides if you want. I technically didn't initially. I didn't want to use slides. I wanted to just talk, but I realized that it'd be more interactive if if I if I use some form of slides. Okay, fine. So so basically, this is all what I said earlier. That for the qualitative variables, they are either into nominal or ordinal scale. Once the, that qualitative variable has some form of ranking in there, then it automatically is ordinal. So if I ask you this question, that um, the brands of let's say brands of or let's say ranking of let, um, let's say ranking of um, countries with respect to, let's say GDP. So if I ask you something like ranking of countries with respect to GDP, you know technically countries as a variable would have been nominal because there's no ordering. We cannot say Ghana is. You you can only um, add ordering once you attach another characteristic to the to the countries. If you are talking about let's say the size of countries then you cannot have ordering. If you are talking about, let's say, the GDP of countries, then you can have ordering. In that case, it becomes ordinal. But when you are talking about countries without adding any form of additional characteristic or information, then it's strictly nominal. So always, be, so always you have to, you, the statistician, you should be able to know. And, and all these things we're talking about, someone will ask, what's the essence? What's the essence of, first of all, knowing qualitative variables and qualitative variables? We are going to learn very soon that the type of variable would actually determine the type of statistical test you can perform. And we also learn that when we start a regression analysis, we will find out that even the, the, um, the qualitative variables, I forgot to tell you that qualitative variables too, we have two distinct types of uh, um, quantitative variables, sorry. For quantitative variable, we have two distinct types, okay? We have Discrete, discrete, and then we have continuous variables. Okay, so keep in mind that the numerical variables, those variables that naturally take up numbers, height. If I ask you what is your height, you give me a number. If I ask you what is your age, you give me a number. Okay, but one thing I want you to keep in mind is that all numerical variables or quantitative variables can be categorized into two. We have discrete um, 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 variables and we have continuous variables. Now, the difference is that for the discrete variable, they can never be fractional or they can never be decimal or they cannot take fractional values. So right now, if I ask you what is what is your the, the, the number of chairs in your room, you won't tell me you have 2.5 chairs. And that makes it a discrete variable, okay? If I ask you how many people actually died from COVID-19 um, in Ghana, you cannot tell me maybe 700 and. 20.5. No, it doesn't work that way. You, you, you get what I mean? So in that case, it makes them not. So anytime you hear a variable, number of anything, number of anything, number of something can never take a decimal value. So it makes it discrete. Now, keep in mind that for continuous variables, they can take up um, 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 decimal. So you can actually uh, measure someone's height and, and get maybe 2.5 something uh, meters. You can actually get 2.1 meters. You, you get what I mean? Um, so that's the, the, the difference. I mean, just the, that's just the, let's say, the layman difference um, between um, discrete and, and continuous variables. When you start with the statistical modeling, you find out that the type of numerical variable would also inform the type of statistics you can do on it. So, so they are very useful. They are useful information you need to know. All right. Now, I'm just going to talk about data structure because you are going to do data analysis. You are going to talk about data analysis. It will make sense to have a fair idea. First of all, how should you restructure your data? There are so many people, especially those who are not very statistical, who might be interested in doing research. And sometimes they don't even know how to even restructure their data. Now keep in mind that Excel is very useful um, to, to, to summarize your data, okay? If you are using even programming languages and other softwares, which we'll talk about later, so you find out that Excel actually is very useful. Now, as you can see from this, you realize that the, the variable headings are always the first row. If you look at table one, the variable heading is the first row. Table three, the variable headings are the first row. So we have observation, we have I, we have T, we have Metal rate. So that's the variable headings. Then the actual data actually comes down, isn't it? So, so technically, that is how you should always restructure your data in, in Excel. 
Okay, so in Excel, when you have your data structured in Excel, you can up, you can easily import it into any programming software. Okay, and this is how you should always structure your 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 data, and don't have multiple Excel sheets when you are working with a programming. I mean, any form of um, statistical software. Don't. So what I'm trying to imply is that suppose um, um you you created let's say three different Excel sheets. I mean one Excel, but you have three different sheets within the Excel and you are importing it into, let's say R or a programming software, you might be getting errors. Okay, so it's always advisable that one single data should occupy only one, one Excel file, okay? And then when you're importing in some softwares, you might change the extension of the Excel to something called CSV. I mean, we'll talk about that later on and tomorrow too, we will, we'll learn about that as well. But I just want you to keep in mind that Always, when you are entering or restructuring your data, always the first rule should be the variable names or the variable headings. Okay, then each other rule becomes data for your subject. Okay, now we have so many types of data. We've already talked about different types of variables. So here you realize that each column or the the column headings. So this is the first column, individual. This is the next column, and so on. Now each column can either be qualitative or quantitative, okay? Each column can either be quantitative or qualitative. Um, so anytime, but it doesn't mean that, so for instance, if you look at this variable, female, you realize that they've written one and zero. It doesn't mean that female is now quantitative. That's why I said that assigning numbers to um, categorical variables or quantitative variables, actually that doesn't make them what, qualitative, but what they do is that it only helps us to actually do analysis with them, okay? So as so we call these dummy variables, assigning um, zeros and ones is dummy variables. You can use one and twos, you can even use three and four. All you have to tell them is that three means males and four means females and you are good to go. Now we have different types of data structure. Each data structure would also inform the, 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 the kind of statistical test you can do. And um, I should have told you earlier that this meeting is being recorded and then it will be uploaded on YouTube as well, um, especially the status card um, bit. So don't, don't worry when I'm going a bit fast because we don't have too much time. And you can always watch the YouTube video at, at your own pace. I mean, I will talk in depth about that as well. Um, so let's, let's proceed. So we have different types of data structure. The first one is cross-sectional data. Now, what is a cross-sectional data? So cross-sectional data is simply a data that we collect at one time point. So suppose you are collecting data within a year. So this one, they collected data within a year and the year was 1990. It doesn't mean that they collected all these data in 1990. It doesn't mean that they collected it at a particular day. It could be different days, but their, their, their whole focus was that within a year. So if it's within a year, it doesn't matter when you collected it, once it's within a year, it still makes it still makes it what cross-sectional. So the focus of cross-sectional data is that for cross-sectional data, we we collect data um, across different subjects within one time or within a, a year or within um, a single time point. Okay, so it could be within a day, it could be within a week, it could be within a year, whatever you want. Okay, so that's cross-sectional. And look at this for cross-sectional data, each row. Each single row corresponds to one subject. What I mean by one subject is, I don't want to use one human because it's not always that your experimental units or observations or subjects will be humans. You could have inanimate objects as well. Okay, so it could be fish, it could be, it could be chairs, it could be anything depending on what you are interested in studying. But predominantly, it, it, it could be humans. So for cross-sectional data, I want you to keep in mind that every single row corresponds to only one unit, oh, sorry, only one individual, every single row. An individual cannot have more than, uh, one, more than one row for cross-sectional data. So that is one thing I want you to keep in mind. And most of the regression models that you are going to fit, there are most instances, you should be able to know that if the data is cross-sectional and the data is either um, pooled cross-sectional, which I'm going to talk about it, and panel and data, we analyze them differently. So for cross-sectional data, I just want you to know the difference that for cross-sectional data, um, every single row corresponds to only one subject, every single row. So if you have 10 row, uh, 100 rows in this case, it meant the steady participant were 100. That's what it implies for cross-sectional. Now there are instances where it's still cross-sectional, but what happened was, um, so if you look at this one, 
if we look at this one, um, when you talk about the, the pooled cross-sectional, look at the difference between, um, look at the difference between the cross-sectional and the pool. Look at the years. For this one, all the subject data were collected in 1990. Now for this one, imagine there are instances where you are collecting data, you are, you are, collect, you are interested in collecting data, right? But the data you are collecting for each subject, like I told you for cross-sectional, every single subject should have only one record. That is one rule. But there are instances maybe you collected, let's say, data on first hundred people in, in 1990. And then in, 19, in, in, in another year, which is 1991, you also collected information about other different individuals. So you realize that it's like it's, um, each, individual's, uh, each individual's data was collected at one time point, isn't it? However, not all the subjects had their data collected at the same time. That's basically what the pooled cross-sectional implies. So the word cross-sectional implies that each subject has only one record of data, okay? And the cross-sectional also implies collecting more than one variable or one information at a time, okay, at one single. So you realize that for all these cases, um, all these are in a way cross-sectional, table three, table two, the data there are all cross-sectional. Why? Because we have more than one variable or information, okay? However, what distinguishes be between these three, first of all, is that for this one, every single subject has only what? One data records, but, and all the data, data were collected within the same time period. But when you look at table two, it's technically the same as the cross-sectional data, which is technically the same thing, but the difference is that not all the subjects had their data collected in the same year, okay? But each subject had only one record of data. Are you okay with the, with the, with the, with the, with the difference between the pooled and cross-sectional and then the cross-sectional data? Now, when you talk about panel data, um, aka longitudinal data, this is very useful data that we usually collect. And what people do if, um, if statistically erroneously or what people, the mistake people have been doing is that They've been using models for cross-sectional for panel data. And a lot of people don't know how to even analyze longitudinal data. And longitudinal data are data which are naturally observed in reality. How? So look at now for the longitudinal data. You realize that for the first two rows, this one corresponds to subject I, and subject one. The first two is for subject one. If you remember for, for the cross-sectional and then the put cross-sectional, each subject can only have one row meaning that each subject can only have one record of data. But with the, with the longitudinal situations where we are actually collecting information about each subject over time. So meaning that if I consider one particular subject, I'm collecting maybe your information yearly, maybe in 10 years, I'm collecting your information every year. I went record like those follow-up studies. And if you look at COVID-19 um, 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 vaccine efficacy, you realize that they will consider some subjects and after considering the subject, they'll be, they'll be measuring some variables, okay? They will measure maybe their blood pressure, they'll be measuring certain things, okay? Temperature and other things. It makes it cross-sectional. But they'll be make, taking this measurement over time. And taking this measurement over time means that for each subject, we would have more than one record for each subject, okay? When if I say more than one record in, 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 in the context of data means that a particular subject can have more than one, one rule. One subject could have five rows. And it, it doesn't mean that all their, the, the number of time points will be the same for each instance, okay? Meaning that some subjects could have, let's say, data for five time points. Others could have more than five time points. It doesn't matter. But once you have a data like that, it's what? Panel data or longitudinal data. If you want to do any form of regression, keep in mind that if we use a regression model or any statistical test or any statistical models, for cross-sectional, rather for panel, everything you've done is wrong. And one thing we have to note is that for the statistical softwares, they will do what you tell them to do. So getting output from statistical softwares doesn't mean you are doing the right thing. You can actually be doing the wrong thing, but get a very nice resource. Okay, so keep in mind. So knowing the, um, the knowing the type of variable, knowing the type, of, the kind of data structure you are working with, should also inform the kind of statistical analysis you can do with them. Okay, and we have one one also common one that we call time series data. And um, so for the time series data is basically collecting, let's say, so the time series data to the data is collected at only one um, um So for instance, we are collecting, let's say, um, um, 
maybe COVID-19 cases every day, daily. So if I record the number of COVID-19 cases in Ghana, let's say the number of um, um, recovered cases, okay, or let's say the infected cases, and I'm recording it every day, then in that case, we are going to have a daily data, okay? And you realize that with that, I'm not following up on any single individual. It's just one, it's just one. So it means that for the panel data, when you consider each individual, each individual's data is a time series. For the panel data, when you consider each individual, each individual's data is a time series. And then so meaning that panel data is actually a combination of cross-sectional data and time series data. Because we said that for the time series data, we are collecting information about a single subject or a single variable over time. By the very moment we consider more than one subject while doing that over time, that makes it panel. Okay, so panel data is technically a combination of cross-sectional and time series data. All right, and, and like I said, the, the different structures would inform different kind of statistical analysis you can do, and be very careful not to use a model that only works for cross-sectional data for panel, okay? But whatever model that works for um, the panel data would also work for the, um, um, could also work for the pooled cross-sectional for some reason. Um, which I will explain because of the time in there, um, but let's continue. Okay, so now the next thing, so first of all, we've already, just to wrap up, we've already talked about um, a, a bit discreetly about statistics. We've already um, 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 talked about the kind of variables we have, and we say we should be very careful that we have two types of variables. We have numerical or quantitative, and we have categorical and what? Um, or categorical or qualitative. And we said that assigning numbers to um, categorical variables do not make them quantitative, okay? It only makes them um, useful for us to be able to do further analysis with them. That's why we assign those dummy variables. Um, now, one thing we have, we have to keep in mind, I also made mention that every statistical test, we have the parametric and non-parametric version. And I also told you that every statistical model, we have the parametric and non-parametric um, version. Just that for the models, we have a semi-parametric instances, okay, which I will explain what type of model could be semi, okay, I will explain. But but if I want to go in depth with what is the difference between non-parametric model and then parametric model, you find out that for the parametric models, we have finite number of parameters that we want to estimate. So if you take a regression, a typical regression model, for instance, and let's say I have five independent or five predictor variables that I want to see how they influence a certain dependent variable, okay? Let's say I want to know um, some five variables, how they affect maybe inflation in a, in a country, how they affect maybe um, recovery, um, 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 maybe recovery or whatever. So in that case, what I'm trying to imply is that in a classical regression, the number of, if you have five independent variables, automatically each independent variable will have its own parameters, okay? Each independent variable, if we have five, would have its own um, um, parameter, okay? And so at the end of the day, five independent variable implies we have five um, um, parameters, just that there's always something we call a constant that we add to it, making it six. So I just want you to keep in mind that always for parametric models, we can actually count how many parameters we are trying to estimate. But for non-parametric models, it has infinite number of parameters. So for non-parametric models, they are, they are actually instances where you cannot actually estimate all the parameters, or you cannot know all the parameters, or you cannot count them. They, they could be infinite. So just keep in mind that that is actually the, the statistical difference between parametric and non-parametric. But the term parametric actually implies that if we are talking about statistical tests or statistical models, and we are talking about it being a parametric method, Parametric methods, they have strong and specific assumptions that needs to be that needs to be met. So that's what distinguishes also the, so we have different ways of distinguishing what a parametric test is and non-parametric test is, what a parametric model is and non-parametric model is. Anytime you hear the word parametric, it implies that we have some strong and specific assumptions that you need to meet before you can use them. So you don't just say, I want to do ANOVA because you, you've seen people using ANOVA to compare means across more than three groups. You should, more than two groups, three or more. You should be able to satisfy some conditions because it's a parametric test. So just keep in mind that if you want to, so it doesn't matter whether in your school, um, you are not, um, they are not too much into statistics, but for some reason you might want to publish your work. So it's always good to do the right thing. And what I'm saying is that 
if we are sticking to a parametric me method, whether being parametric model or non-parametric model, okay, what I'm saying is that there are some specific, strong and specific assumptions that needs to be met or satisfied. If you know that you are not interested in satisfying those conditions, go for non-parametric test. Because non-parametric tests, they, they are robust to statistical assumptions. And they are also have um, weak and then um, um, non-specified um, assumptions. So it means that for non-parametric tests, if you don't want to worry more about what assumptions, you go for non-parametric tests. However, if parametric tests are actually, um, if the parametric assumptions are met, parametric models will always do better than the non-parametric test. So keep in mind that if parametric, um, if parametric um, um, assumptions are met, non-parametric uh, tests will do better than non-parametric tests and parametric models will do better than non-parametric models if the parametric assumptions are met. But if parametric uh, assumptions are violated, then you can clearly see that, I mean, the reverse will happen, okay? So, so technically the non-parametric tests and non-parametric models are more robust to assumptions, okay? Fine. Now, I'm just going to, um, 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 elaborate on just few um, statistical tests we can do. And then I want you to also keep in mind that we have different type of statistical tests you can actually do, okay? So now I'm just talking about statistical tests. I'm not talking about statistical models. So what I'm talking about is statistical tests. So we shouldn't confuse statistical tests with statistical models. Okay, so in most of your studies, irrespective of the field you find yourself, you come into, you come at, at the point where you be comparing means across groups, okay? So, so keep in mind that if you want to, um, so like I said, if you want to do statistical tests, okay? The, so now I'm, I'm not talking about models at the moment. So if you want to do statistical tests, we, I said we have parametric uh, test and non-parametric test. Every parametric test has its equivalent non-parametric version. That is also one thing I want you to keep in mind. Every parametric test has its non-parametric version. Now, if you are comparing, let's say, means across groups, the first thing we usually think about, so you should know the various types of mean comparisons or the various types of mean tests and know when to use a particular one. So, so you shouldn't be confused at this point, by the end of this study, you shouldn't ask someone, oh, I want to do a mean comparison test. This is the kind of data I have. What test do you think I should do? You should be able to tell me. Now, when you talk about pair T test, so pair T test is basically when you have, so for instance, let's say for each individual, I recorded, let's say, your temperature before I gave you, let's say, some vaccine. And I also recorded your temperature after I gave you a vaccine. So you realize that for each individual, we have, let's say, two measurements. And, and, then, and then the two measurements are coming from a, the same individual. And suppose we now consider more than one individual, meaning that we consider, let's say, let's say 30 individuals, where we, we have records, their measurement, their temperature measurements before I gave them maybe some form of intervention and after I gave them some form of intervention. When you have such instance, okay, that is when we, we and you want to compare the, the means between those two groups parametrically. That is when we use the pair T test. Why? Because the two measurements are still coming from the same individual. So it makes the two measurements um, dependent on each other. Are you okay? But it only becomes independent when I consider two different groups of individuals. So let's say I measure temperature of let's say some 20 individuals and I consider at a different 20 in, uh, um, set of individuals and I measure their temperature and I'm comparing the two. Or maybe I take some females, okay? And those females, I consider another set of females and I measure, let's say their BM, BMI and I, me I measure the body mass index for the first group, the body mass index for the second group. Because the body mass index is not coming from the same ind individual. Is, and don't, keep, don't say that because the two groups are both females. So females means that they are dependent. No, what we mean by dependent implies situations where you took measurements of, of, of a subject before and after some intervention. In that case, those two measurements becomes dependent. And it's not always that the measurement will just be two measurements. There are instances you took more than two. And that is where repeated measures actually comes in, okay? So keep in mind that anytime it's just strictly two measurements you took from a single individual and you did that across several individuals and you want to compare their means parametrically, we actually use the pair T test. Independent T test comes in when you're comparing means between two independent groups. Now, um, um, I'll talk about the Bonferroni pairwise test. Let me talk about the repeated uh, measures. And, uh, okay, 
ANOVA here. So for the ANOVA is just an extension of the independent t test. As I said, the independent t test is comparing means between two independent, strictly two independent groups. And then the ANOVA is comparing means and um, between more than two. Okay, so meaning that if you have three or more groups and you're comparing their means, okay, statistically, and you want to check whether there's any um, significant difference in their means, in that case, you go for ANOVA. Now, whenever ANOVA is significant, there's a further statistical test we do, okay? Because if the ANOVA is significant, the next thing you would want to do is to now check, suppose there were three groups and ANOVA concluded that, oh, there's significant mean difference in those three groups. The next thing you are interested in finding is that for group one, is there any significant difference between group one and group two? Is there any significant difference between group one and group three? That is where the pairwise um, um, comparison test also comes in. And for the pairwise comparison test, I only mentioned one here. I mentioned Bonferroni pairwise test, but for the in the parametric contest, Bonferroni is good enough, but you can, there's also something called um, 2K comparison. And for 2K, it has a limitation. The limitation is that when you're actually doing a multiple comparison with 2K test, it, we expect that for each group to have the same number of subjects or the same number of um, sample size for each group or else you are going to get very unbiased, um, uh, sorry, very biased and, and, and results, okay? But if we are not, if you are not too sure, or if the number of groups are not the same, you can still go in for Bonferroni. Even if the groups are still the same, you can still go for Bonferroni pairwise test within the, within the, the context of parametric test. And then the repeated measures ANOVA is just an extension of the pair T test, whilst the ANOVA is the extension of the independent T test. So I, I should have just say independent ANOVA. I mean, I mean, just to say that for ANOVA, we are comparing um, the means across more than um, um, two independent groups. But for repeated measures, where situations where you collected or recorded information about uh, of a subject about more than one time point or more than one time, okay? So you have temperature, you took um, first temperature reading, you took another temperature reading, and you took another temperature reading, and you want to compare the means. Please don't make a mistake to find the averages of each of the or, um, or the averages of the trade um, um, time points to represent the data and then um, tell me that you are going to use maybe um, independent t test or whatever for them. No, you should be able to, since the data was actually collected um, at, let's say, trade time point or more, okay, and you still want to compare the means between more than, between two or more groups, uh, sorry, between two or more, of course. So for repeated measures ANOVA, even if the, the groups are two, okay, but you collected information more than two times, you can stick to repeated measure ANOVA, okay? So two or more, but you collected um, their information more than um, two time points. But if they are just two groups and you collected their information at just two, two instances, that is where the pair T test um, comes in, okay? And then we know what the repeated measures is now doing. It's just an extension of the pair T test. Now there are instances where you are comparing, let's say, means, let's say I'm comparing um, um, inflation rate, the mean inflation rate across, let's say, countries in Africa. So you realize that there are more, there are more than two countries in Africa. So it implies that, um, suppose um, I even make it between the regions of uh, Africa, maybe West Africa, East Africa, North and South. Suppose I'm comparing, those are the four groups I'm trying to compare their average inflation, okay, um, across those four groups. Classically, we can stick to the um, ANOVA, isn't it? Because there are four independent groups, okay? And then we are comparing their, mean, their means, um, mean inflation. But what about situations where you have more than one variable you want to compare their means? Let's say you have more than, you don't have only inflation. You also want to compare exchange rates. You also want to compare monetary policy rates. Maybe you also want to compare um, um, interest rates at the same time. Keep in mind that doing different or separate ANOVA for each of them will lose some form of degrees of freedom. Anytime you do a statistical test, you lose degrees of freedom, okay? So, so keep in mind that, and you don't want to lose a um, lot of degrees of freedom. That's why it's always, um, and I wouldn't really want to say we are being uh, economical here, but keep in mind that if we're able to do several tests at the same time, you get a better power in terms of the power of the test. So what I'm trying to imply is that, um, if we want to now um, consider, compare the means of, let's say, the mean inflation rate across those four um, 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 divisions of Africa, and then you are comparing exchange rates, maybe interest rates, 
do them together. And that is where the MANOVA comes in. So MANOVA is multivariate ANOVA. Um, so this is the first time you are hearing the term multivariate. Let me clarify the, the difference between, um, um, Gilbert, what's the time now? Just want to be sure um, the time now so that. Yeah, it's currently 8.11 here. It's 8.11 here. So that means it should be 12.11 at your place. Okay, and so, so I think um, we have about eight minutes more, eight minutes more for you to wrap up. Yeah. Oh, then I have to run. Okay, okay. If that's the case, then let me run quickly. Um, so yeah, so and, and keep in mind that um, um, for the, this parametric test, your data should be normally distributed. If your data is not normally distributed and you do a mean test, you are going to get very wrong results. Why? Because the mean is affected by outliers. You all believe with, uh, you all will agree with me that outliers are just um, um, extreme values, okay? So suppose I have three data points, let's say one, two, three, and I find the mean. And suppose the one, two, three, I replace the three by let's say 100 and I find the mean. You can clearly see that that when I replace it by 100, the mean value will, will increase towards the value or the mean value will increase, isn't it? And, and But if I want to find the median, if it's one, two, three, and I increase the three to 100, still the median will be the middle number, which is two. So the median is not affected by outliers, but the mean is affected by outliers, okay? So keep in mind that in order to use the parametric test, all these parametric tests I mentioned about the mean test, the first thing you have to test is, is your data normally distributed. And people have been making this mistake they, they say that when your data set is 30 or more, it means it's normally distributed. It's never true. That 30 or more technically goes for the central limit theorem. That is actually the distribution of the sampling distribution of the mean. Okay, So don't confuse the sampling distribution of the mean for central limit theorem for the data itself. So a data which has 30 or more sample size is not normal. You cannot conclude it's normal. The normality is about the sampling distribution of the mean or the test statistic of the mean that you'll be using. Okay, so just just keep that in mind. Okay, fine. So so technically, if the if the, the sample size, if the data is uh, thirty or more, you can actually use um, um you can actually use these parametric tests as well. Anyway, but I just wanted you to keep in mind that if the data set is um, thirty um thirty or more, doesn't mean the data itself is normal. It's not true. But keep in mind that for the parametric test, your data sets should be large enough or your data sets should be normally distributed. Yeah, okay, so that those are the conditions. But situations where the data is not normally distributed, I said comparing means would, would um, result in um, um, misleading information or misleading conclusion. So in that case, we compare medians. You see that non-parametric tests are written. Each particular um, test, the position of each test is the non-parametric version of the parametric test here. So the pair t-test, eight non-parametric version is the Wilkinson sign test. The independent t-test, eight non-parametric version is the Mann-Whitney test. So it means that situation where you wanted to compare a means between two independent groups, and you find out that the data was not normally distributed, don't force yourself to use independent t-test. You can still use Mann-Whitney test and still arrive at the same conclusion you would have arrived. But this case, you have a statistical backend behind your conclusion. So keep in mind that if the data is not normally distributed, comparing medians makes sense because the median is not affected by outliers. And then for ANOVA, the non-parametric version is Kuskawalis. And for the pairwise, uh, for the pairwise comparison, the non-parametric version, um, for instance, Benforoni non-parametric version, we call Benforoni dance test. Okay. And then the repeated measures ANOVA. So don't force yourself if you collected data um, of individual at more than three time points, and then the, the data itself was not normally distributed. You can stick to Friedman's test, which is the non-parametric version of the repeated measures ANOVA. And then MANOVA, which is doing multiple ANOVA is um, eight non-parametric version is multivariate Kruskawalis test, okay? And then we have several tests. We have tests for proportions and correlations as well. Um, um, and then, so we, um, so this is actually, I think the last, the last but one. So, so I just wanted you to keep in mind that we have different, lot of mathematical and statistical models. And then regression model is one particular um, branch uh, model, set of models that you'll be using a lot in your, in your studies. So anytime you're interested in looking at the linear effect or relationship of some predictors or some set of variables on a certain dependent variable. And keep in mind in this case too, the, the, in, in the context of regression, when we say univariate regression, it means that you have only one dependent variable. But at the very moment you hear something called multivariate regression, it means we have more than two dependent variables. So meaning that you can actually have a regression model where you have more than two dependent variables at the same time. But when you hear the term multiple, so there are instances you hear the word 
um, um, multiple, multiple linear regression. When you hear the word multiple linear regression, it doesn't mean that the dependent variable has more than two depend. I mean, the dependent variable has more than two variables. No, multiple linear, multiple linear regression simply means that the independent variables were more than one. When the independent variable is just one, we call it simple. So if you hear simple regression, it means the independent variable is one. So I can actually have a multivariate simple regression, meaning that I have two more than one dependent variable, but only one independent variable. So it makes it multivariate, um, multivariate simple regression. The very moment I call it bivariate simple regression, it means we had only two dependent variables. Trivariate means we had only three dependent variables. And then more than more than three, we can say that multivariate, okay? And even two, you can conclude on multivariate. So keep in mind that multivariate in the context of regression means several dependent variables, whilst multiple means several independent variables. And simple means that only one independent variable, okay? And here we have class of, so many class of regression models. So we have something called generalized linear model, okay? You get the recording of this, so don't worry. You don't have to memorize everything. Now keep in mind that the nature of the dependent variable Actually, the nature of the dependent variable and the nature of the data informs the kind of regression model you can use. So they are, these are the two most important things in order to conclude on the type of regression model you can use. The nature of the dependent variable and also um, the, the nature of the data you are working with. If the data is cross-sectional, we have a class of, so if the data is cross-sectional, all these class of models will fit into a cross-sectional data. The first one, if the data is cross-sectional, if the data is panel, whether pooled cross-sessional or panel, you can it, it, it will go into the generalized linear mesh model. What I will explain a little bit further. So keep in mind that the nature of the dependent variable indicates the type of regression and also the nature of the data anyway. But the dependent variable is the key thing here. So if the dependent variable is continuous, you can use the OLS regression. If the dependent variable is categorical, that is where you use logistic regression. So here I was supposed to say multinomial, binomial and multinomial logistic regression. So if you hear the word logistic, it means that the dependent variable is categorical. But when the dependent variable has only two levels or two categories, we call it binomial logistic regression or binary logistic. But if it has more than two, um, 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 category, then we call it multinomial. Now, Poisson regression, quotient Poisson regression, and negative binomial regression are used in instances where the dependent variable is discrete. Because I told you that when it, when the dependent variable is the nature of the dependent variable informs the, the the type of model. So if you're depend, if you're looking at factors influencing the number of road accidents in Ghana, and you use OLS regression, you are wrong because the dependent variable is what it is discrete. So you have to use Poisson regression and Poisson regression has an assumption and that because I told you that all these are parametric models and we have to satisfy some specific assumption. Poisson regression has an assumption that the mean of the, de the dependent variable and its variance should be equal. If it's not equal, it means there's something called dispersion in the data. If there's dispersion in the data, it can lead to wrong conclusion. So in such instance, the quasi Poisson and the negative binomial regression actually becomes useful when there's dispersion in that data. The generalized linear mesh model are suited when you have a panel data. So with this one, what we do is that the independent variables of interest are what we call the fixed effect uh, variables or the fixed effect. And then all sources of replication. So don't forget that if it's panel, there was replication in time, then time becomes something called random effect. Anything that adds additional randomness to the data, it could be randomness due to time, repetition in time, or it could be repetition in space. Suppose you collected data across some locations over time. Those locations can contribute to something called spatial pseudo replication or spatial replication. In that case, when you're fitting the model, you should be able to account for all those sources of replication, whether in space or in time, by adding them as something called random effect, okay? So, and then the independent variables of interest becomes your fixed effect. So that's basically what the MISS model does. So meaning that not all your variables will be considered as um, as variable independent variables of interest, or not all the variables will be considered as fixed effect, but those that causes um, um, additional source of replication, be it temporal replication, that is repetition in time or repetition in space, actually forms your random effect. Now, the generalized additive model is actually, Gilbert, um, can I get a little time, a little extension because we didn't, we didn't technically start um, exactly on, um, yes, exactly yes, on, uh, at 11. Yeah, so what the we time can give you, yeah, it's now 8.20. We can give you like six minutes more. Okay, six minutes should be fine. I'll wrap up. Okay, so keep in mind that all these regression models we are actually using, okay, it's a linear model. 
what we are saying is that we are trying to predict the linear effect of some predictors on the dependent variable. But there are instances where not every variable might have a linear relationship with the dependent. Let's look at COVID-19. If you look at COVID-19, for instance, we said that children or those who have low age or um, low, um, like children, for instance, they, are, they were less likely to get the infection, isn't it? And then those, um, um, those within, um, like people like us, I mean, the, 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 those in the middle age group, were also literally less likely to get the infection, right? But the children were more or less likely than the middle group comes, and then the aged were more likely. In that case, it's a typical linear relationship in terms of prevalence. So it means that age in that case have a, um, um, a linear relationship with the prevalence of COVID, isn't it? But situations where we have a disease like malaria, which can affect more children and also affect the aged more than those of us in the middle group, in that case, it has a nonlinear relationship. So if you probably do a scatter plot, okay, you might not find a linear trend in such a data in terms of comparing age with the prevalence. So in that case, we use something called additive model. With additive model, those variables that do not have explicitly linear relationship with the dependence, because the linear models is assuming that each variable should have a linear relationship with the dependence, be it GLMs or the GLMs or the um, linear and uh, the mixed models, okay? It's assuming that the dependent variable, the independent variables have a linear relationship with the dependent. But is it always so? Because there are instances where some variables will have non-linear relationship. So what the additive model does is that it fits something or splines to those variables that do not have no, a linear relationship with the dependent. Fitting splines is a way of trying to smoothen those variables so that we would be able to get something relatively linear. Okay, so that's all what the additive model. So it's not doing anything much different from the from the GLM. The only thing is that some variables would not be entered into the model as as it was. We would have to do some transformation by fitting splines to them in order to make them almost linear with the dependent because we want to make linear prediction, isn't it? And then we have some class of models which a lot of you might not be aware. We call it machine learning algorithms. An example of these machine learning algorithms are classification to random forest gradient boosting machines. We have extreme boosting machines. You can read on them and keep in mind that um, the machine learning algorithms, we have one for time series modeling. We have any model, eight, all the parametric models. It appears that we have eight machine learning algorithms that can equally do better. And the machine learning algorithms are supervised and sometimes unsupervised learning. So they pick your data and then they're able to learn a lot from the data than sometimes most of these parametric methods. So it's something you should also think about. And then keep in mind that when you have, when you're fitting a regression, not all the variables will be considered in the model. So how do we uh, select variables that are supposed to be entered into the model? So we have something called variable selection techniques. These are always the first thing you need to do before you fit any regression model. So we have stepwise regression, we have penalized regression methods, and we have um, recursive feature selection. Okay, now beware of multicollinearity. So multicollinearity is that when you're fitting regression models, we don't expect high correlation to exist among the predictors. We want high correlation to exist between the independent variable and the dependent, but not among the predictors. If there's high correlation among the predictors, what happens is that it causes multicollinearity. What are the effects of multicollinearity? You find out that there are instances where your overall model is significant, but none of your independent variable was significant. Technically, if one of your independent variable, at least one of your independent variable is significant, then we expect the overall model to be significant. But situations where the overall model is significant, but none of your independent variable is significant, or at least one of your independent variable is significant, but the overall model is, uh, is insignificant, then it means that there was multicollinearity. And in that instances, it meant that you have to deal with the multicollinearity by eliminating those variables that causes or contribute to those multicollinearity. Meaning that variables that are highly correlated with each other, we can take them out or we can take one of them out. How do we do that? How do we know those who, who are um, 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 having high correlation? We can compute something called variance inflation factor or something called um, tolerance. They are good measures. And if we have high multicollinearity, almost all these models, all the first three will not hold, okay? But if the first three doesn't hold, the penalized regression models actually comes in. They are suited to situations where we have high multicollinearity in the data. You can equally use the penalized regression models, okay, to still fit such data with high multicollinearity. So it doesn't mean that if there's high multicollinearity, throw away, don't do your regression. We have other things that can equally do, deal with that. Range regression, lasso regression, 
um, elastic net, and we even have another class of model called envelope based models. All right. So now this is the last thing. So about the statistical uh, softwares that can be used for data analysis. Keep in mind that we have the SPSS, Stata, eViews, Minitab, but keep in mind Stata and eViews are more useful for econometric modeling. Those who have been doing regression or those who are doing a lot of time series analysis, Stata and eViews are very useful. And Minitab can also be useful in that sense. So Gretel is also another statistical software. And Excel Stat is also a statistical software. But I, you see, I classify all these into one in, in, as one group. Why? Because they are not programming languages. Okay, so all these are statistical softwares, but they are not programming languages. Even though Stata, you can program within Stata, doesn't mean that it's a programming language, okay? Um, it, because it was built on other languages. So it's not a programming language. R is, to me, that's actually, so R and Python so far are the most, let me say, um, the most popular uh, statistical softwares that is in the market. So these two are dominating the data science market, okay? So R and Python. And then R is what I, I have expertise in both R and Python, but R is my, my first language and then Python is my second. And now I am interested in Julia and I'm also using Julia. The reason is because Julia is faster. If you want to look at the, the programming languages, Julia and, 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 and C, both C and C++, C++, Julia is as fast as C. So what the statistician did was they wanted to, they knew that R is very powerful in terms of statistics. So R is specifically for statistical analysis. And Python can be used for statistical analysis, but it's usually useful for numerical analysis, as, a, as especially those in the pure mass field. But for, Py, for R, you can also use it for the numerical analysis, but it has extra packages for any statistical test you want to do that you might not find in Python. But for Python, if you want to do any numerical analysis, you are confident and you want to do something called symbolic programming. I mean, sometimes you want to integrate. You don't want to, if you don't even know how to integrate manually, you, you, the software can do the integration for you. That's what we call symbolic programming, okay? So Python can do that. R can do that, but sometimes it, it, it needs a little bit additional effort, but Python will do that with ease. But Julia combines the capability of R and Python and is also faster than um, R and Python. So when you are programming in Julia, you, the syntax is not different from Python and R. They are similar, and but the additional advantage is that this is much more faster. SAS is also useful, but technically it's also a programming language, but R dominates it. MATLAB is a semi-programming language. It's not technically a programming language per se, but it's a semi-programming language, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a debate that people have been um, fighting over whether we should classify MATLAB as a programming language or not. But these are just few statistical softwares. But for um, tomorrow, we'll be using R. And, and, and the reason why we are using R is because as far as a statistics, um, I can prove to you that R is technically the best among all of them. But for the Julia, it's useful when you need to add additional speed, okay? Of course, when your, some of your models are very complicated, so that it takes a lot of time. There's something called paralyzing your course. You can paralyze your course to run on multiple cores. At the moment, if you run any um, 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 analysis on any software, it's using um, um, a single core on your computer. But when you parallelize your course, it's able to run on multiple cores. But Julia will do, Julia actually is much faster even without parallelization. And you can imagine after you parallelize your course, what will happen, okay? So I will end here because of time. And then um, tomorrow we are going to stick to, um, we are going to do um, one of these regression analysis and then learn a, a, a little bit of some of the inferential statistics that I mentioned. And just to recap, um, keep in mind that I already started um, a form of initiative. Okay, so I'm done with it. I'm done with this. I'm done with the talk. And um, this is just um, um, a little announcement.